Hi, everybody. How is everybody doing today on this great, amazingly beautiful Tuesday? Can you believe we have been with you now over 37 shows? It's hard to believe that this all started with just the dream and the hope to provide inspiration and motivation during this time of COVID, our stay-at-home order, our shut-in. You know, we were all just faced with so much at once. I just wanted to provide something back to my viewers, to the clients that we have at the firm that we hold so dear. And in doing so, you know, we just started evolving and coming up with just some great content and some great ideas. And I'm so grateful for my amazing team at the Cronin Law Firm and to each and every one of you, our fans, our Facebook viewers, our YouTube uh, viewers, our YouTube appreciation, you know, people that we love it. And <laughs> it's just so fun to be a part of this amazing community. And today is our season finale of the Cronin Challenge to Change series. We are taking the month of August off. We all need a little break. And we're also going to regroup and revise and bring to you better and better content. So give us the month of August and I promise you we'll be back better than ever. And we're going to be lining up some amazing guests and we're going to be returning on September 1st. But I will continue to be providing you with some short live streams on co-parenting issues. And I'm also going to be lining up some amazing things for our fall 2020 workshops. I want everybody to feel empowered going into the fall season, especially with school and, you know, with co-parenting issues surrounding school and returning to school. And we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen with school, with their shut home, you know, stay home orders, stay, stay home, stay safe orders. You know, that's how Governor Whitmer did it for Michigan. But we don't know in other states across the country, they might have issues. They might have questions. You know, and this is global. This is a global concern, co-parenting. We're not just, you know, limited to Michigan because it's a it's a global issue. Everyone across the globe, you know, deals with co-parenting because every, a lot of countries face divorced parents and, you know, separated parents, parents who may not have ever been married, but are now dealing with trying to raise a child or children together. So, um, please like our Facebook page, join us on our YouTube channel at Cronin Law Firm, and we are going to be providing you with content regularly. And again, please look out for our 2020 workshop series because it will just be providing, be providing you so much amazing content and value. So that's, I just wanted to give you that little debrief of this event here, but, um, I also wanted to share with you that I've been chosen, so excited, that Scene Magazine, typically they do a live event that they charge thousands of dollars for, but again, they're wanting to provide you with lots of you know, value for their, their viewers and their readers, and they're going to be having a free virtual event on September 25th, which is a Friday, and they've asked me to be the head of the parenting networking group. So um, again, this is through C Magazine. It's a free virtual event, Friday, September 25th. Please be on the lookout for it. And I'm so proud and honored that they asked me to be the head of the parenting networking group. And um, look out for that and sign up for it because you will be getting some amazing information on that as well. And it's free. So, and you're going to be getting all my expertise and passion about learning how to co-parent effectively. You know, I always say, if I can do it, anyone can do it. So please, please, please like our page, come back to our channel. We are going to be uploading amazing content throughout August, but also we're going to be resuming these workshops in September. Um, so let me just recap a little bit about, you know, where we started and where this all started. As most of you know, I'm an attorney and I've been practicing law for over 25 years. And when COVID hit, you know, so many people were just so scared and so many people were, you know, just not sure how to deal with things. And a lot of our clients, you know, called and said, you know, what do we do? Where do we go? And, 
And specifically with respect to co-parenting, people didn't want to give their children back to the other parent or they were afraid or they didn't know what to do. And when schools closed, it was just all so confusing. And then we had executive order after executive order and people trying to, you know, figure this out on their own. And I thought, you know, there's, there has to be a better way. So I started the challenge to change thinking, you know, giving our viewers and our, you know, clients some answers may help them. And then week after week, we provided amazing answers to some really tough questions that everybody had. And, and then I thought, you know, let's provide more. Let's give them more. And, you know, we had then the Cronin Law Show, which we were answering topics on many different areas of the law. And the challenge to change arose when I thought people can do better. People can be better. Let's focus on how we can just make our families better, our communities better. And then from an idealistic perspective, our nation better, right? So we're always trying to do better and be better and look for better in the other person. But in order to look for better in the other person, well, we have to show up better too, right? So I came up with this challenge to change series because I wanted to challenge ourselves to be better. And then from week to week, my team came up with some amazing guests to deliver to you every week. And from those guests, we gave you stories of hope and inspiration. You know, we had someone talk about the struggles of weight loss and being a stay-at-home mom, and especially with COVID and trying to maintain those daily rituals. That was Ashley Silverman. And we had an elder care specialist talking about how she was really trying to work and adapt in the time of COVID and the stay-home orders, especially with her elderly care patients. That was Belinda Grinwald. And then we had Risa Kirshner, who was the author of a book called Feel Better Mommy. I mean, Risa survived just a near-death problem and, and episode during a very strenuous time in her life when her marriage wasn't that great. And she survived this awful disease, a heart disease that she had. And, and then she wanted to talk about what it was like for her child to be, you know, in that situation. So she wrote a book and then she gave hundreds and hundreds of books to moms and dads and kids dealing with a sick parent, especially now during COVID. I mean, what an amazing give back story, you know, she's giving back and, that was Risa. She spoke so well about that. And then we had Rebecca Agnew, my cousin, who spoke about, you know, working at Gilda's Club Detroit and how she helps so many families, you know, with people going through, you know, struggling with cancer and the families of cancer victims and how that can, that community helps them. She's also a musician and she was talking about her career and her passion of just making change and make, giving hope and inspiration through her music. We also talked to Denisha Lyons. Denisha Lyons is just such a creative, fantastically talented chef, a pastry chef. She owns Petite Sweets in Detroit. And she talked about you know, how she just really learned how to overcome and adapt, especially now during COVID when her business had to shut down but then through COVID, she reopened and was, you know, doing more takeout orders. But, you know, she had to scale back, especially because of all of the different, you know, events that had to cancel. So you are not the only ones affected. Look at, you know, countless other people have been affected by this, their businesses. But instead of wallowing in, you know, the taking that victim role, they, they wanted to become champions and they wanted to do better for themselves and their families. And, you know, we also talked to how these other, you know, communities and other groups are helping our communities, like the Lighthouse Music event, Howard Hertz and his son, Ryan Hertz, giving back to the community, raising money for those affected most during COVID. And, you know, around the clock presentation of artists and music and just raising money and raising awareness. And then we had an amazing story of Tiffany Johnson, who was a shark attack survivor. And then she was also a survivor of a horrible car accident twice. She was spared twice. 
and she is making the most of her life and giving back and not again, not looking at, oh my gosh, you know, I'm a victim. I deserve this and I need this and feeling entitled. No, she turned it around and she's making the best of it. And what is she doing now? She's a motivational speaker and an inspirational speaker. And she's trying to give back and share her life experience to give hope to so many people who need hope and who need that extra oomph to know that their life is worth living. And I know that, you know, throughout this COVID period that we're still all experiencing, race relations has been just such a hot topic, a hot button. And unfortunately, it is still an issue in our country and globally. But we have come so far as a nation. We have come so far. I don't want anyone to forget how far we've come. Do we have more work to do? Yes. But I think as a nation, we have more work to do in so many areas. Instead of being divided, let's come together. And we had Dr. Sabrina here talking about race relations, answering those tough questions. How can we come together? How can we put the past behind us and move forward? How can we stop looking at everything in, you know, such a negative derogatory way? Let's look at the positives. Look how far we've come. You know, years and years and years ago, do you remember when a black man could not marry a white woman or vice versa when it was so frowned upon? Do you remember back in the day when nobody would even look at a black president? Well, ladies and gentlemen, we elected a black president to be our president twice, twice, not once, but twice. So let's look at the positives. And if we need to stop looking at the media, stop looking at just the headlines that talk about all the negative things, because we have a beautiful nation. And if we continue to tear it down, and if we continue to have all this violence in the communities and across the nation, well, then we're not holding dear our values and our truth that we need to come together as a nation and we cannot tolerate violence to that degree, not violence against any other person and not violence against our communities. That destruction is not healthy, ladies and gentlemen. And this whole idea of co-parenting and being kind to one another, you know, take it one step further. It's not just about co-parenting our kids. It's about being kind to those we work with. It's about being kind to the person that may have a different viewpoint as you. It's about being kind to that other, you know, public official. It's about being kind to that other police officer, even though you might not, you know, be digging the police at the moment. It's about kind to being kind. It's about being respectful and holding those values. Simply because you may not agree with someone's viewpoint does not give you the right to be mean or disrespectful to anybody else. I don't know if you can hear me loud enough. Again, just because you disagree with someone's viewpoint does not give you the right to disrespect them, okay? I know I'm coming across as preachy, but I'm a mom and I can do that, but we have to start somewhere. And until and unless we all agree on that common denominator that we are all equal under our nation, I believe in God, so I believe and I want to say we are all equal under God. If you have a different belief system, that's entirely up to you. I'm respectful of your beliefs. Please be respectful of mine when I say be kind, be respectful, and let's value one another as human beings. Let's not look at the content of anyone's skin color other than the content of their character. Let's look at the values that we hold within us. Let's look at who we are as people and let's be kind and respectful. And Dr. Sabrina spoke so well about that. And I urge each of you, if you need to, please look her up. She's amazing. And I also want you to go to um, Sourcebooks Detroit. If anyone has any questions about anything, the owner, Janet Webster Jones, and her daughter, Allison Jones Turner, are phenomenal. They know so much about every single topic, and they can point you in the right direction. 
in terms of any books you're looking for, any idea you might have, anything you want to research or look into, dig deeper. Don't just go on the surface of things. Please call Sourcebooks Detroit. They're online. They have an audible version of some of their books. And they can answer any questions you have. And they're just lovely, lovely people. And they will be able to steer you in the direction if you have any question. And, you know, I had Taryn Asher on last week. And she said the same thing. Don't just look at the headlines. And if you really want to know something about a particular topic or idea, don't just look at one perspective. Look at the other perspective. And then maybe you'll have a better, firm understanding, full understanding of just how things are. And don't just take someone's word for it. You know, I know we love our families and we respect our friends and their viewpoints, but if that's perhaps not your viewpoint, don't just feel like you have to go along to get along. You can look through things. You can look through the different, you know, so many different articles on so many different topics and go, go, go to Sourcebooks Detroit and take a look at some of those books. And I know Miss Jones can definitely point you in the right direction. She's, a, she's an amazing, brilliant woman, and she has a lot of wisdom behind her. And then we have Mr. Tony Stovall. He is the owner of Detroit's oldest men's clothiers, Hot Sam's. And his vibrant, dynamic daughter, Lauren, they run this store amazingly. And they talked about their challenges as being you know, Black owners of a smaller store in Detroit, especially now during the race relations and, and how things are. But they've also talked about how far we've come. And that's what I'm trying to press upon you now. Let's look at the positives. Let's look at our beautiful nation. And that's, I just can't understand why people want to tear it down. You know, I don't care what side of the fence you're on, but violence is not right no matter what side of the fence you're on. Please, everybody, please stop this violent behavior. It's not good. It's not good for you as a person. It's not good for the country. And I, I implore each of you to stop reacting with such high emotion. Take a breath and pause and, and realize what you're destroying. And don't light fires. Don't go into these cities and towns destroying home, you know, storefronts and buildings. It's doing nobody any good. It's tearing us further apart. And I say that with my parents struggling to co-parent effectively once their relationship is split up, you know, tearing down the other person to make yourself feel better really in the end doesn't do anybody any good. And you're just living with that venom inside you. And so my philosophies and my theories really are not limited to just parents and co-parents. As I've said to you several times during this broadcast already, it stems beyond ourselves. So the minute you really want to lash out at that other person or tear down that building or light a fire in someone's storefront, you know, or, you know, be a jerk to someone who cut you off the road, just take a moment, take a breath, and say, you know what, what good is that going to get me? Why am I doing that? Why am I behaving this way? And then over time or after a few minutes pass, that emotion, that high anxiety, that high anger won't be boiling up inside you so much. You have to learn how to control your anger and your emotions. And then we'll have better families, we'll have better communities, and we'll have a better nation. And getting back I want to talk a little bit about Sheriff Chris Swanson. I interviewed him. He was the sheriff who knelt down against a violent protest. He took, disrobed, he took off his um, gear, his armor. He took down his battalion. He took off of it his shield and his sword, so to speak. And he walked with his community. He made global headlines, ladies and gentlemen, when... There were so many violent protests, and I know we still have violence today. I'm not, um, you know, saying that there's not. But during this time in Flint, Michigan, our town of Flint, Michigan, that once was known for a whole water crisis several years ago that was just an awful situation, and so many families and homes and towns suffered 
on the water, the, the Flint water crisis, but he turned it around and he put Flint on the map for something so positive and so amazing that he joined the community. He walked and he had his fellow law enforcement officers walk with the protest and they turned a potentially violent situation into such a peaceful, um, amicable protest um, that it was it was really beautiful to see. And so I had him on and he spoke to our guests and our viewers and then he spoke globally. He was interviewed and still is being interviewed for this act of heroism that really just took a moment, but it was in that moment that you saw his true character coming out. And his true character is truly a peaceful one. He wants to be one with his community and he wants the community's voice heard. He and so many of us want those bad eggs out of law enforcement that really don't need to be there, that should not be there. He, you know, in every professional, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, there are those bad seeds and there are those bad eggs. And it's not limited to law enforcement. We have it across every different profession. You can find it from plumbers all the way up to doctors to, you know, politics. We have it everywhere, guys. But it's up to us as people to turn that around and to try to use our good to benefit others and get the bad seeds out and to keep the good people in. Violence should not be tolerated no matter where you are, whether it's a doctor using his good talents for evil. Remember that doctor years ago that we heard that, you know, he was giving chemotherapy and radiation treatments to patients that didn't even have cancer for what money. We have that. We have, you know, bad law enforcement officers, bad cops killing people that shouldn't be killed, murdering people that shouldn't be tolerated ever. We have violence with our own, within our own communities. Should that be tolerated? Never. So guys, remember, be the better person and better will result. So after Sheriff Swanson, we talked with Kathy Saputo. Kathy Saputo was an amazing counselor. Throughout this stay home order, we've seen not only violent behavior and, you know, our, our violence and our, you know, mental capacity challenged, but we've also seen our emotional capacities challenged. And even those people that are otherwise so tough and so resilient, they have seen their lives challenged in ways that they've never been challenged before. And we had Kathy Saputo talking about the mental health aspect. And we need to remember that so much of this, what we're talking about, is keeping our mental health in check, keeping our minds sharp. When we keep our minds sharp and when we keep to our daily rituals, whatever that is for you, you know, to help you get along in the world of today, make sure you keep your daily rituals, you know what those are, and you take some time for yourself, you know, and, you know, a lot of these watches now, these techie watches will have, you know, moments to breathe and moments to do other things, walk, get out, read, take some time for yourself to decompress and you'll be all the better for it. And then after we had uh, Kathy Saputo, we had Dr. Joel Kahn, a globally known medical scientist, science, science expert, rather, a physician, a cardiologist, who was talking about how we take care of ourselves, you know, physiologically and physically to make sure we're the best people we can be. Because, you know, our bodies are composed of our, you know, our, our, our cells are humans, our human beings. We are both mind and body together. And we have an emotional aspect to us. So unless our bodies and our minds are all working together cohesively, then that's the best version of ourselves. And then we can be better emotionally. So it's, it's like um, it's all of us coming together, all of our body parts, our mind, our body, our spirit. I really believe that until we can work 
with those three components into one, then we'll be the best versions of ourselves. So remember, follow a healthy diet, follow a healthy regimen, read healthy things, keep your minds positive and focused, and you will be better people, then you will be better co-parents, and then you will be better in our communities. And no more violence, people. That, you know, that, that should be zero tolerance, period. Um, I spoke about Taryn Asher. And then last week, the last but not least, was Chief James Craig. Chief Craig of Detroit, Michigan, has devoted his entire life to public service. He is truly a force, and he is an amazing example of how we can come together to bridge the gap, not only in our communities, but with race. He is a black man in a chief law enforcement position. You don't think he's seen his share of challenges in his lifetime? Well, I wanted to talk with him about all of those challenges in depth, but unfortunately our audio on Facebook was stymied. We're working on that and we're hoping to get that out to you. I did record half of the show um, and once our audio is fixed through Facebook, I'm hoping that you will be able to see that as well. But um, until then, we are working on getting another segment with Chief Craig. He did promise to be on our show in the weeks to come. So please be on the lookout for that. So, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you don't take all of my talking and ranting as too much lecturing. I just want us all to be just living joyful, peace-filled lives. You know, I don't think that's too hard. And I know some of you think, oh my gosh, I just can't survive another day. Um, you know, we had Ryan Beal on the show. He is an amazing therapist. He now has a great university program that is designed to help younger people, teens and adults learn how to cope with mental illness, um, suicidal ideation and, and suicide attempts and actual suicide rates are astronomical. And during the stay home order, we had seen that number increase to a devastating number. And I want everybody to know that if you are, if any of you are out there, if you're feeling that way, if you're feeling hopeless, there is hope. There is hope. Please call me. I don't want anyone to feel in despair or so despondent that they don't see a way out. Sometimes when you're focused so much on that one thought, your mind is such a powerful tool. It's such a powerful computer. It continues to go down that negative downward spiral. So we need to work on that. We need to work on those people who are so focused on the negative. It is hard, but it's a muscle. You have to move that muscle. You have to work it like any other muscle in your body. So if you can focus on one positive attribute of yourself, whether it's your smile or your eyes or your strong feet that get you around every day or your strong hands that can help you to find you know, some phone numbers, whether it's the old fashioned way through a phone book or on your phone to help get you out of the slump or whether it's the blue sky or the stars at night, your eyes, if you're focused on a positive something, I don't care what it is, as small as it is, the birds chirping, the sun out the next day, your mind can't go to a negative thought at the same time. You have to be focused on something positive and then you'll get out of that slump and day by day by day, building that muscle will help build that positive momentum in your life. And then focus on what you want in your life and then that will be brought to you every day. The more you focus on what you want, the more it will be brought to you. The more you focus on the negative and on what you had and you don't want anymore, the more that will be brought to you. So when I, when I do my co-parenting workshops and my motivational workshops and my workshops about human relations, I really try hard to have everybody do these small exercises. And it's in doing these exercises that they see just how good their life is. And that's what I want for all of us. 
in our nation. If we focus on the negative, well, that's what we're going to see all the time. Let's focus on where we've come, not only as a humanity, but as a nation. And we'll do great and we'll be better for it. So I'm getting a lot of questions. Sorry, I didn't mean to just ramble on and on. But let me go through my questions. Um, here's one. Hi, Sabrina. I have taken some of your advice on being a more forgiving co-parent. And it's working. Is it normal that my ex has highs and lows when dealing with me? <clears throat> Is it normal? We were always battling. Um, well, you cannot control the other person. All you can control is, yes, that's right, you. So, yes, it's. I'm not going to say it's normal. I don't know who your ex-husband is, but sometimes we get Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Sometimes we get, you know, a nice person on the other end, and sometimes not. We don't know what they're dealing with. We don't know what's going on in their day. So all you can do is not react to it. You know, stop taking things so personally. And when you stop taking things so personally, then you look at things differently. And nothing has meaning except the meaning you give it. So don't give it that much meaning. Don't give it that much power. Go about your day. Respond to what you know you're two, you, you two are talking about. Take a breath. And then maybe respond. Or, or don't, depending on the situation. But, um, you know, don't battle. Take a deep breath. Don't try to win your point. You don't always have to win. You don't always have to be right but you should try to do the right thing. So that's my response to that question. If you have any further questions specifically about it, I'm happy to take it. So feel free, we're, we're on for another 25 minutes. Here's another question. I am having issues with my son's mom. We never married and I am having issues with my son's mom. We never married and she recently moved in with her boyfriend who has three kids. Suddenly, our schedule that worked for us is now being shifted to her boyfriend's schedule, and it no longer works for me. She is being unreasonable, and I don't feel like I need to rearrange our schedule. What can I do? We were not having any issues before they moved in. Okay. <clears throat> this is more common than you would think. What happens is um, when you have a blended family situation with your ex or the other parent and their side, they try to merge those days and times together so that the, 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 the two blended families now have the same schedule. If it doesn't work for you, you have to say so. If it, you know, as long as they're not trying to change an order of the court, then you can work with them. And please remember, even if you have an order, but it works for the two of you, you can deviate but only if it works for the two of you. You don't have to deviate from an order. If it does work for the two of you, I highly encourage and recommend and suggest, I can't suggest it and, and I cannot uh, emphasize this enough, put it in writing, whether it's an email agreement that both sides agree or even written, sign your names to an agreement if you're deviating from an order. If you don't want to deviate, if you don't want to do this extra and give in, then you don't have to. You can simply say no. You can simply say, I'm sorry, this doesn't work for me, or take out the sorry. Say, I regret this doesn't work for me. I will try to accommodate you in the future. Or if you can give me more notice, I'm you know happy to accommodate. Whatever it is that you can say that works for you, um, and if it's reduced to a text message, then just say that. Just say, um, you know, I, I regret I can't, you know, accommodate your schedule, I will try in the future, please give me more notice or whatever it is. Make sure that you're abiding by, that she or he is abiding by the court order. Don't change the amount of overnights either because it's a court order. And if the more you start changing the amount of overnights, the more you're gonna start getting into a different custodial arrangement. So you have to make sure you're not doing something contrary to your best interest and the children's best interest. Always look to what's in their best interest and always try to do the right thing. Remember, it's not about being right all the time, okay? So here's another question. 
I'm a grandparent that is really close with my granddaughter and her mom. My son has made a lot of mistakes and walked away. Um, so now he wants back in after four years and my former daughter-in-law does not trust him, rightfully so. And my son is angry with me for not sharing my time with him. Um, I feel he needs to earn it with his ex and I don't want to lose my daughter-in-law's trust. How can I exist in this circle? I don't want to be involved, yet I'm involved. Well, you are in a rare situation in that you are closer to your ex, former in-law, than you are with your own son. So that's a tough one. And in Michigan, Michigan grandparents' rights are really non-existent. The only way they really exist is if you have that relationship with that other, with that other than the parent of those children. So the fact that you have that relationship with your former daughter-in-law is, is great. But I would highly recommend also if you, you know, want to talk to your son, there's no harm in that. Reaching out to your son, you can have a relationship with your son. But in terms of getting in the way or interfering with what's a court order, you, you can't and shouldn't. If you have a relationship with your former daughter-in-law to the point where she's letting you see your granddaughter, well then I would still ask her opinion and ask your former daughter-in-law's you know, opinion because it's truly her right to give, not yours. So you have to speak with your former daughter-in-law about her desires and, you know, if you are able to see your granddaughter, that's wonderful. And I think you should continue that because children need all generations in their lives. They need all families in their lives. You know, their cousins. I, I, I have so many clients that, and my own kids, you know, it's so important to maintain that normalcy. And I always say, even if you, the two parents aren't together anymore, it's still a family. I mean, just because the two parents split up doesn't mean that the families can't try to get along for the better benefit and betterment of the children. You know, going back to my segment with Ryan Beal, he spoke about, and I know the statistics about the high rate of the suicides in young people. And we also know the statistics that the millennial generation is waiting to get married because of what they saw in their parents. You know, they didn't like how their parents treated the divorce or how they were young having to grow up living in suitcases or feeling alienated from one parent or the next. That's a high anxiety situation for those kids. And if you can lessen that anxiety, that's better for them. So remember, they didn't ask for this divorce. So do what's right for them. Don't, you know, put them in old clothes or clothes that are too small to go to that other parent's house. I mean, that's childish behavior and that's negative behavior. You know, if you're afraid that the clothes or the items aren't going to be returned, well, if your children are old enough, talk to them about it. If they're not old enough, well, then you know what? The next time you can save $10, go to Target or go online or go to a thrift store and buy some clothes that you can put your children in that is that they can fit, you know, and that are, are decent clothes for them. So don't punish them for having to go back and forth. They didn't ask for this divorce. Always remember that and stop the disparaging comments about each of you to the other, to the children. Don't, don't do that. That just breeds anxiety in those children. Like you cannot believe. Um, so I'm, I'm going to get back to the next questions. I'm a grandparent. Whoops, that was the one I just read. Here's another question. Sorry about that, guys. My husband took our children on a play date and was exposed to COVID. He has to quarantine for the time being, but insists he should still have the kids on the weekend. I am telling him no because the kids can bounce it back and forth between us. I offer to make up weekend. Is it unreasonable for me to put my foot down? Okay. So 
this has been a hot topic, obviously, with COVID. And um, it, it was also a hot topic for a lot of our clients, our viewers, who are working the front lines in the healthcare field. So the court came down and, and ordered that all parenting time and custodial orders pri prior to COVID had to remain in place during COVID. That's a given. However, if you believe that your children may be exposed with the other parent, then you that other parent has to be reasonable and say, okay, for the two weeks, I'm going to limit my exposure to my kids, but I do get makeup parenting time. That is a very reasonable limitation and boundary for the health of your children and for the health of other people, because we know that children can be carriers and now we're seeing children can be infected as well. So you want to be safe. You want to be cautious. We know that the coronavirus is real. It's out there and it can have devastating effects on some people more than others. We don't know how certain things are affecting people until you get it. Sometimes people don't have any symptoms in their transmitters. Sometimes people get full blown, you know, infections and die. We've seen it. So if this is a bone of contention with the other parent and they still insist on seeing that child, if you share joint legal custody, you both have a voice in that. You can say, no, I'm not letting you see the children this weekend, but I will give you makeup parenting time after the two weeks quarantine is over. So long as you haven't been re-exposed, you know, they have to be responsible adults as well. And they owe you an explanation of where they've been, who they've been exposed to, and to really make sure that your children are safe. And if you fear for that, then you hire a lawyer and you make sure your rights, your children's rights are being protected because the court is taking this very seriously. And if one parent is not taking it seriously, most courts will not look favorably on that. So you do have a valid point as a joint legal custodian. If you don't have joint legal custody, well, then you have a different situation. So that's a huge caveat. Unless you have joint legal custody, you don't really have a voice in that. So most of you, though, do have joint legal custody. Remember, there are two types of custody, legal and the physical, which is really reduced to parenting time now in Michigan. So look at that. Make sure you have joint legal custody, and then both of you have an equal voice in that. But remember, the courts will look to what's in the best interest of those children. But you cannot deny parenting time without makeup. So make sure you get that in writing in the makeup parenting time and make sure you follow through with that, both sides. Um, here's another question. I recently learned my wife had an affair with a neighbor. His wife is not aware of this, but I am furious. I am thinking about telling her, but my wife has managed to inform the neighbor, and now he is being aggressive and combative towards me in an attempt to keep me away from his wife. This has now caused a huge issue as I have been accused of trying to steal something from his garage as a reason to make me the villain. I also just served my wife papers, but now my character is being tarnished in a neighborhood where I lived three years before I married my wife. What should you suggest? She has no ownership or rights to my house, but has caused a major mess. Um, so who has caused a major mess? I'm not really sure of that. Um, Oh, okay, so my team is saying the wife has caused a major mess. Um, the wife of, of the, the man or the wife of the... The wife the, had the affair. The wife had the affair. With the neighbor. The neighbor. So is it the neighbor's wife? The neighbor's wife says, you know, he wants to tell her. Okay, so... This is tough. This is tough because this is a really a moral choice. Um, this is beyond a legal issue. So it just depends on how messy, you know, you want to get in all this. It sounds like the husband is being super defensive because he knows he was wrong. And so he's making you now the bad guy. And 
you know, it's that saying, he who doth protest too much, right? So he's making you the villain. I've always had the mindset that the truth will find a way to come out eventually. Truth always surfaces, whether it's in one year or five or 10. Sometimes you have to be very patient for the truth to come out, but it usually does. And you can take the high road and not get yourself, you know, muckied up with this. You know, there's a saying, you know, about walking, you know, being in the gutter with some of those people, but you want to walk on the high road. Sometimes that's a better way to be. I'm not just talking about, you know, in a situation like this, but in life in general, you know, um, it's kind of what I was preaching about earlier about taking the high road with how we are in our communities and how we are with race relations and how we are with all the destruction and the violence in our world these days. Um, so, you know, is it wrong that they had an affair? Well, if you're of the mindset that when you marry and you're not to have, you know, any kind of extramarital affairs, or if you believe in faithfulness and, and being faithful and, and having that fidelity vows, and if you believe in that, then yes, it's it was wrong for her to do that, in, in your opinion, if you believe in that. Um, and most people do. Most people, when they, then they take that marital vow, they have a vow of faithfulness with it. But you can't control anybody else but your own actions. If you want to talk to the wife and you feel like you need to because you want to protect your own reputation, well, then that's something you should do. I would try to do it in the most peaceful, amicable way possible without placing blame. Sometimes we have to look at ourselves and our own actions. And, you know, I'm not saying that there's any justification for affairs, but sometimes, you know, affairs are a symptom of a greater problem. So you have to look at a lot of things and only you, after much thoughtfulness and mindfulness, will you be able to really know what's good for you and what's right for you and your family. And if you have children, remember, you have to do what's right for your children. Your children are also involved in this, whether you like it or not. And, you know, you want to make sure that your neighbors are being kind to your children. So you don't want to do anything to jeopardize that either. And you don't want any, you know, scuttle or, you know, negative reputation in the community. So just remember, be mindful. And it's, it's your reputation too. And it's your children's lives as well. So that's really my own, um, you know, answer to that. You kind of have to look within and, and take a breath. And, um, you know, my remember that saying that, um, you know, when a snake bites, it's not the bite that destroys you. It's the venom that seeps through your blood. So um, sometimes you just have to let things go. And sometimes you, you know, need to push back a little. It's really only you will know. And you'll know when you know. So um, I have another question here. Please speak to the determination made by parents about virtual school or in-classroom school. What if the two parents disagree? How are child care tutoring costs determined? For example, if my kids go to virtual school, I won't be able to work as much, let alone hire a babysitter or a tutor. Okay, this is another hot topic. And unfortunately, this is a real one. And with our governor not really speaking to this yet, you know, she keeps threatening about bringing us back to an earlier level. And if we go back to an earlier level, then the schools won't resume. And it's scary. I mean, I have three kids that are in school and, you know, when I was home with them trying to work and homeschool last semester, it was tough. It is tough. And thankfully, I'm grateful. My ex, their dad, and I were aligned in that. So the thing that you have to remember, if you share joint custody, Look to what's in the children's best interest and look to what you need to do to maintain your livelihood. You know, we all have to make money. And if you have to go to work and your other parent is mandating a virtual school, well, then that other parent might have to step up. If both of you work and schools are resuming, 
albeit on a, you know, either a limited capacity or with all of the special protections in place, the two of you have to really work together and, and set aside your differences. And if you want to call me, I can help walk you through coaching you through some of this. Um, but you have to look at what's in the children's best interest. But that, that is a little broader because if, if you can't make a living and if your job is going to suffer and you need to pay the rent or pay the mortgage, get your children you know their much needed lunch money or pay support, whatever it is, well then that's the bigger picture. So sometimes you just have to suck it up, you know, suck it up buttercup and do the right thing for your kids because this ain't no dress rehearsal and your kids are only this age one time. So to make a difference in their lives, whether it's in classroom or virtual learning, you have to do what's right for them for both parents. You both agree. If you have joint legal custody, you both have a say. But you better come to terms with that pretty quickly and have a plan because if you don't have a plan, well, then it's going to go sideways really quickly. And if you need to, get it in writing. Okay. And if you need a law firm to help you with this, please call me at the Cronin Law Firm. My team and I are ready, willing, and able to assist you around the clock. All right. So remember, have a plan. Um, I have uh, one last question. Oh my gosh, it's already 1225. How fast time flies. Um, Question. So in a major change of life circumstance, me and my husband have decided to make a parenting flip. He lost his job. So I offered him the ability to move back into our house to help him with the kids because I am still working. He will stay in the basement and we agreed not to go on dates or expose us to any outside risks for COVID. Our kids are 8, 14, and 16. We haven't told the kids yet. How do you feel about this? We both have good relationships with our kids. I just don't want them to think we are getting back together. So kids, you know, kids are kids. Are kids. kids are resilient. And all children, I don't care who you are, really most, I should say, not all. You know, I don't like these absolutes. But most children really want to see their kids together. I mean, to see their parents together. Most, most kids do, you know, I mean, think back to when you were a kid, when you saw your parents fighting, you know, you hated that tension. You hated that. If they see that you are doing that for the sake of them and their, and their well-being, then they'll be like, you know what? Mom and dad were able to set aside their differences out of love for us. And why don't you say that to them? Say, you know, your mom and I or your dad and I have come a long way and maybe have a joint meeting. I suggest you getting your three children together and the two of you in one room and answer their questions honestly and openly, but age appropriately. You don't have to give them too much information, but be age appropriate in your response. And you'll know what that is. If you have good values, you'll know what that is. You'll know how to respond to their questions. And if they ask if you're getting back together, you say, you know, Mommy and Daddy have come a long way, and we, we are such good friends now. We respect each other, and we're better friends now than we were, and we have a mutual respect for each other, and we love you kids so much that we want what's healthy for you, and we want to make sure you have a stable home environment. And no, we're not getting back together, but we are such good friends, and we love you dearly. And that's how you answer it. And I think any child can respect that. And they will probably like that you can be in the same environment together without tense fighting, without any kind of anxiety. Because if you're okay with it, then they'll be okay. Children pick up on your vibe and on your feeling and on your emotion more than you know. And it's not what you say. It's your actions. It's your feeling, it's your vibe, it's your energy, and they will like it if you like it. If you're tense about it, if you're nervous about it, if you don't want to do it, then don't do it. Don't do it because you will not be a good parent for your children during that time period that they need you so desperately, especially with another stay home order, you know, moving over our heads. So remember, just be the best you can be. And what feels good to you and what's right for you will most likely be right for everybody. 
maintain good boundaries, maintain a peaceful disposition, get a hold of your emotions, get a hold of yourself. And, you know, everything will fall from there and everything will be great from there. So it will fall into place from there. That's what I meant to say. So, you know, I'm so excited just that I had this opportunity to be with you. This was our last show. It was our last show of an amazing run. I can't believe it. 37 shows, ladies and gentlemen, what started out as just my vision to give back and to give hope for everybody has really, in my humble opinion, has really proved to be something pretty special. I'm so thrilled and humbled by the amazing guests we had on our show this entire season. I can't wait for just another great season to come. In the, in the month of August, as I said, we're going to be giving you just some minor, you know, co-parenting and workshop tips and ideas for being better people and building better relationships. Again, whether it's with co-parenting, whether it's that uh, parent son or parent daughter, whether it's sibling to sibling or, you know, other young people or even employer employee relationships. I'm here for you. I want to answer any and all questions. So please send me your questions so that I have them for the next time I go live because I really want to address all of your questions. And I'm also available anytime you want. Please, you know, I'm doing a lot of coaching in terms of what to say, how to say it, who to talk to, how to talk to them, what to do and how to behave. And remember, it's just all about trying to be the best versions of ourselves that we can be. It takes discipline. It doesn't happen overnight. It's like that muscle. We got to work. We don't want it to atrophy. So please remember to like our Cronin Law page, both on YouTube and on Facebook. And again, I'm Sabrina Shaheen Cronin signing off from an amazing series. Take care, everybody. Godspeed. And we'll be back. Have a great day.